Michael, Professor Madsen, uh, it is a great pleasure for me indeed to be a part of this novel forum. Um, one can say that this perhaps is the future, that we are engaged even more to try to come to a wider audience by discussing very important issues for the development of our democracies, for the rule of law and, and human rights. I want to thank i and Verfassungsblock for being pioneering in this field. I think this is, as I said, an extremely opportune time for us to be able to engage with each other in this environment that we live in. My overall message today is one of stating that independent and impartial courts are fundamental pillars of the, of the European Convention system. We, the courts, the courts engage with enforcing the fundamental principles of the rule of law and human rights in a manner where I think one can justifiably say that without independent and impartial courts, the convention system would be an empty vessel. And that brings me also to uh, the question, why, why is the issue then so important? Well, the issue is important because the ensemble of judges, judges at national level, judges in the international environment, they form a community, a community of judges tasked with a very important uh, role of ensuring that convention rights, human rights, are operational at national level. In this sense, I've often said that all judges, national judges included, are in this sense Strasbourg judges. And my overall message today is that this is a task which requires that the independence of the judiciary is, is, is protected as a fundamental constitutional pillar of the convention system. I'm gonna proceed in four brief parts. The first part I intend to describe a bit the main manifestations of the case law of the Strasbourg Court when it comes to judicial independence. In my second part, I want to explain to some extent the way in which applications are lodged by individuals in civil and criminal proceedings under Article 6, and the way in which judicial independence comes into play in those kinds of cases. My third part, I will then focus on an ever-increasing group of cases, and that is that those are cases where judges themselves are lodging applications under Articles 5, 6, 8, and 10 of the Convention by themselves asserting their own convention rights, but adducing arguments based on the separation of powers and judicial independence in the furtherance of their claims. In my final part, I will say a few words about the existence of independent courts and what the existence of independent courts means to preserve and enhance what I'm going to explain to you is the democratic virtue of human rights law. Now, let me turn to my fir first part. What kind of cases does the Strasbourg Court receive which deal with judicial independence? And one can, as I mentioned, categorize them into three groups. Applications brought by parties, individuals, and companies under Article 6 of the Convention. Applications brought by judges themselves under Articles 6, 8, and 10. And here we're talking about, about measures affecting them, dismissals, disciplinary measures, even internal demotions within the court system itself. And finally, uh, a substantial rise of, of cases have come to the court where judges have claimed as being detained of their freedom, detained uh, domestically, uh, asserted a violation of Article 5 of the convention. These are mainly cases that have arisen after the post coup d'etat, attempted coup d'etat in Turkey. Before dealing with these individual groups, let me mention two general points at the outset. The first is that the nature and scope of the court's methodological assessment for each of these three groups is variable. There are different methodological considerations the court takes into account and the criteria for assessment vary 
due to the nature of the applications as they are launched. And I would also say as sort of my second general point that in the last decade or so, it's clear that we have seen this rise in judges themselves uh, asserting their rights under the convention, which one can say is in and of itself a cause of concern. The judges themselves are considering it necessary to reserve to re resort to convention based or human rights orientated principles so as to safeguard uh, the, their position within the constitutional framework of their countries. I then turn to my second part, which is applications lodged by individuals under Article 6. There are three claims related directly or indirectly to, to judicial independence that can be made under Article 6. The first one is that a tribunal has not been established by law. The second norm which Article 6 provides is the actual stricto sensu claim of lack of judicial independence. A, a tribunal must be independent structurally vis-a-vis -vis other branches of government, the executive branch and the parliament, parliamentary branch, the legislative branch. The third rule under Article 6 is the rule on impartiality. The, the requirement that a judge is impartial vis-a-vis -vis the parties to the case and the interests at stake. Let me say a few words about the first two norms that I have mentioned. Under our established by law jurisprudence, which is relatively, has developed rather incrementally, up until now, the court has first and foremost been seized of cases related to judicial allocation of cases, jurisdictional elements, uh, and things of that sort, not so much related to issues, for example, regarding the appointment of judges, the appointment procedure, the selection of judges, and so forth. There is, of course, an indirect feature of that element in the famous chamber judgment in Volkov uh, v. Ukraine from 2012. But the court now is seized directly for the first time with the, 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 the primordial question, the threshold question, does Article 6, the, the requirement that a tribunal is established by law, does that apply to the actual pre-appointment procedure in the appointment of selection of judges. We have a case now pending uh, from my own country before the Grand Chamber where the court is seized exactly of that issue. And I will of course not comment any further on the facts of that case, but only to say that as we also see from the jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice, which I will revert to in a moment, we see that there are tensions between fundamental principles at play. On the one hand, when we are faced with questions of established by law, we're of course dealing with a fundamental separation of powers issue where the independence of the judiciary must be secured to preserve the integrity of the system as a whole. The independence of the judiciary also secures confidence in the judiciary, which is an absolute prerequisite for the efficiency of courts at national level. On the other hand, a finding that a, a court is not established by law may have implications for, for fundamental principles on the other side of the spectrum. The principle of legal certainty as regards judgments already res judicata. The principle of the irremovability of judges which requires that in only in absolute exceptional circumstances may a judge that has already sitting be removed from office. So the, the, the clash between these fundamental principles is uh, very salient in uh, the disposition of these kinds of cases. The second norm is the actual norm of independence. Now here the court's case law is quite developed. The court has for decades made clear that when it comes to uh, the question whether a judge or a tribunal is independent, the court will look to the manner of appointment, the duration of the term of office, the existence of guarantees against outside pressures, 
and the question whether the body presents an appearance of independence. There are recent grand chamber judgments of the court, Denisov v. Ukraine, uh, and other cases of the grand chamber, which again reconfirm and apply these principles. But I also want to mention, and this is an extremely important point, the assessment of independence is not merely a structural assessment based on the legislative framework in the country in question. But also in several judgment, the court has made clear that acts, even speech related activity of executive members, committee, uh, government ministers and parliamentarians, which are attempting to actively interfere with ongoing legal proceedings may constitute a violation of the independence limb of Article 6. A very recent case, a very good case on this issue is the case of Rinau versus Lithuania, which was decided by this court a few months ago, where the court reflecting on this case law made clear that these kinds of actions in ongoing criminal, uh, uh, civil proceedings could be very detrimental for the independence of the judiciary. As I mentioned, recently the Court of Justice, the European Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg has delivered important judgments in this area. Uh, it is of course not for me to comment in depth on the scope and content of these judgments. What I would however say are two things. The first is that the, the, the Court of Justice's pronouncements in this field and I think this is crystal clear, are inspired by the existing developed case law of the Strasbourg Court. And I would also venture to say that to the extent that they have been, the, the judgments that have been delivered up until now have been the scope of public debate, I would say that they seem to be perfectly in line with the current case law of the Strasbourg Court. Most recently in the, in the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Justice in November, in the case related to the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court of Poland, the AK case, the European Court of Justice made this symbiotic relationship between the two uh, jurisdictions quite clear. I would then say, and this is my second point, if one looks at the core provisions of the Treaty on the European Union referred to and the Charter, referred to by the European Court of Justice, on the one hand, Article 19 of the TEEU on judicial effectiveness, and secondly, Article 27 I would say the Charter, that they see also mirroring within that the framework of values provision under Article 2 of the TEEU. One might ask, is the European Court of Justice in some ways uh, dealing with this issue on the basis of a paradigm of values which is different from the ones uh, uh, which are underlying the convention system? My answer to that is absolutely no. If one looks at the framework of values under Article 2 of the TEEU, in my view, it is absolutely clear, also viewing the preamble to the convention, the substantive provisions of the convention, that the values in play, remember, they are human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, respect for human rights, including the respect of persons belonging to minorities, these are all fundamental pillars of the convention system as well. So in that sense, there is no reason to consider that as a departing point of principle, the trajectories of the courts in this field relation to the safeguarding of judicial independence should be at variance with each other, taking all the account of the different, to some extent, procedural mechanisms within the two courts. My third part, applications lodged by judges under Articles 5, 6, 8, and 10. Now, the first group here is, as I mentioned, judges lodging applications under Article 6, 8, and 10. The first conceptual starting point, which is extremely important, is the finding of the court that judges have a right of access to court uh, under the civil limb of Article 6, which is in and of itself an important jurisprudential step by the Strasbourg Court. It means that in principle, judges at national level that do consider that there have been violations or illegal interferences with their civil rights as determined arguably by domestic law must have access to a tribunal at domestic level to 
uh, uh, exercise or test their claims under national law. The second issue is the substantive dimension. The court has made a distinction uh, between, on the one hand, the Volkov versus Ukraine line of case law, and on the other, Denisov v. Ukraine, the recent Grand Chamber judgment of 2018, between Article 8 claims in cases where judges have been dismissed, and on the other, cases where we're dealing with internal demotions. In principle, Article 8 will apply when it comes to dismissals, but as regards Article 8 applicability, when it comes to administrative internal demotion type decisions, there a case-by-case -case approach has to be made, and it may be the case, like in Denisov v. Ukraine, that Article 8 will not be considered applicable. Under Article 10, our most famous pronouncement is a case most lawyers in Europe will know who deal with human rights, and that is the case of Baca versus Hungary, which was an Article 10 claim uh, lodged by the former president of the Hungarian Supreme Court, where our court, the Strasbourg Court, found a violation of Article 10 due to uh, the dismissal from office of the president based on his expressive statutory activity while in office as president. The second group of cases that I would mention are detention cases under Article 5. And as I mentioned at the outset, these are cases which have mainly arisen because of uh, the attempted coup d'etat in Turkey in July 2016. In total, the court received 5,252 5, post-coup d'etat related detention of judges and prosecutors cases 1,279, to be clear, were detentions of judges and prosecutors. 3,973 3, were based on civil servant dismissals. Now, the strategy of the court here has been to immediately communicate, because of the mass bulk of these cases, to communicate leading or test cases. On the issue of detention of judges, we have recently the first judgment in May 2019 in the case of Alparslan Altan, which was a, an application by a former constitutional justice of the, the, the Constitutional Court of Turkey, in which the court found a violation of Article 5.1 due to the illegality of his detention. It is on the basis of this judgment that the court has communicated a further 546 applications related to the detention of judges and prosecutors, which of course are the, 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 the substantive jurisprudential basis for that communication is the judgment, the judgment that I already mentioned. Very recently uh, in uh, uh, this year, the court delivered judgment in a case called Bash versus Turkey, which dealt with a lower court judge where the court also found a violation of Article 5 this case is not yet final, so I will not comment further on that case. However, let me just conclude this part by making the following general comments. What the, the recent case law under Article 5 and the detention of judges tells us, and this is, this is stated very clearly in the case of Alparslan Altan, actually for the first time in the Article 5 context in relation to the detention of judges, that firstly, the court highlights the special role in society of the judiciary, which, and now I'm quoting from the judgment, as the guarantor of justice, a fundamental value in a state governed by the rule of law, which must enjoy public confidence if it is to be successful in carrying out its duties. The second point mentioned in the judgment, judgment is where domestic law has granted judicial protection to members of the judiciary, in order to safeguard the independence of their, uh, the exercise of their function, it is essential that such arrangements should be properly complied with. And the third point is, I, in my view, the most important, where the court says, given the prominent place that the judiciary occupies among state organs in a democratic society and the growing importance attached to the separation of powers and to the necessity of safeguarding the independence of the judiciary, the court must, and I quote, be particularly attentive to the protection of members of the judiciary when reviewing the manner in which a detention order was implemented from the standpoint of the provisions of the convention. So in other words, 
It is true that under Article 5.1, there is always a heightened level of scrutiny for the court in the evaluation of Article 5.1 guarantees. But one can say that when it comes to the detention of judges, which are detained, which are prima facie based on possibility of acts which are tied to their judicial work, it is clear that that scrutiny becomes even stricter. Let me then finally, uh, my fourth part, uh, be a bit more general and discuss uh, uh, to what extent the, the, the jurisprudence on the independence of the judiciary it has become ever more salient in the work of the court, as we have seen also in the work of uh, the European Court of Justice, and is an issue uh, which needs to be taken extremely seriously. There is a growing debate and a growing tendency in the debate, and we should be frank about this, of claims being made that judicial authority constitutes a threat to politics. That judicial authority constitutes uh, an encroachment on democratic political decision making. In particular, in human rights cases, when judges enforce human rights provisions, either constitutionally or those provisions at national level, which are meant to incorporate the convention. I have always said that one has to be very cautious in such a debate, and I in particular uh, direct my message to legal practitioners, domestic lawyers who are engaged in this kind of debate. This debate cannot be a black and white debate. The issue is simply too complex to allow for very generalized and abstract statements about judges encroaching on the separation of powers or political decision making. Human rights laws, in my view, legitimize, and this I think is a crucial point, human rights laws legitimize political outcomes. I said in a recent lecture, and now I'm going to allow myself to, to have a prepared text here, which I want to use so as to be as clear as possible. In a recent lectures, lecture, I said, courts importantly promote the determination and upholding of rights in ways consistent with the constitutional ideal of legal and political equality. Therefore, legal adjudication and political debate are not mutually exclusive. And I think this is a core issue to bear in mind in the ongoing debate about the, the role of the courts and the importance of judicial independence. These are complementary parts, the, the political branch and the judicial branch are complementary parts of an inclusive democratic structure designed to ensure that all individuals are treated with equal concern and respect. One of the most eloquent expositions of this idea was made by former UK Supreme Court President Lady Hale in a judgment of 2004 in a case called Gaida in, in the House of Lords where she stated, and I quote, democracy values equally, de sorry, democracy values everyone equally, even if the majority does not. That for me is a fundamental starting point for understanding the inclusive democratic character of the convention system. And this also resonates in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. Many years ago, in a famous UK case, Young, James and Webster versus the United Kingdom, the European Court of Human Rights says th said this, and I quote, although individual interests must on occasion be subordinated to those of a group, democracy does not simply mean that the views of a majority must always prevail. A balance must be achieved which ensures the fair and proper treatment of minorities and avoids any abuse of a dominant position. Now, for me, this follows that although a compromise is often necessary for furtherance of peace in a democratic society, it goes without saying uh, the democratic process is a process of compromise where conflicting views receive an outlet 
which allows for uh, peaceful decision making. Political action is meant to find common solutions. But political action, which excludes the meaningful participation of marginalized groups and minorities, is anathema to a true democracy. Unchecked majority rule, unchecked majority rule that takes no account of the interests of the minority risks descending into authoritarianism. This is the core of the democratic virtue of human rights laws. And here, independent courts, truly independent and impartial courts within the convention system have an important role in ensuring that democratic action retains its democratic character and is and in a sense of being truly inclusive and respectful of individual rights. In short, it is clear, and this is my final word on this, without independent courts, the convention system will simply not function. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Josh Spano, and thank you very much for this extraordinary presentation. We will now turn to the Q&A session, and I have already a very long list of questions in front of me, but uh, please keep sending questions via hashtag uh, Ask Spano. Josh Spano, let's start with some questions related to the general institutional evolution and challenges uh, of the court. With the interlaken reform process now concluded, to what extent can it be regarded as fully successfully successful and will challenges still remaining for the court? What factors will be vital for its success over the next, say, 10 years and even beyond? This is an extremely, this is an extremely important question. I, I think I would answer with uh, three points. The first is the interlocking process has been to the extent that it has allowed the court the ability to institute reforms for the filtering and prompt disposition of unmeritorious or uh, uh, cases which do not fulfill admissibility requirements as has I think been a success. It of course being able to dismiss cases promptly for a human rights court is not necessarily an element of success that we want to highlight. What it does, however, it, it gives us more leeway to deal with the more important cases. So the single judge system, the incredible work done by the filtering uh, uh, division of the court, uh, which has now for the past seven or eight years been able to deal very promptly with incoming cases, which of course has allowed individuals all over Europe to receive a first answer on whether cases will be dealt with at all has been, I think, an element of success. My second point is a however. The challenges are, that remain, and I think we have to be frank, the interlock and process, although it has helped us in many ways to uh, strategize with the use of our priority policy in finding ways to ex be more expeditious when it comes to priority cases has still left us with and we still are challenged with a bulk very numerous meritorious chamber cases for those familiar with the priority policy these are cases that fall under category four of the priority policy which are cases which are meritorious there is a potential convention issue, but they are not priority cases. We have many, many cases of that kind. And the third point that I would say then is, for the future, the, the challenge that remains is to tackle very strategically the, the bulk of these cases to an extent to minimize as much as possible the time it takes for us to deliver justice. And, and we are, there are three ways of doing that. Uh, of course, I would wish for unlimited resources. It goes without saying. But the European Court of Human Rights is an institution of limited resources, which needs to be re reactive and agile in using the resources that we have. Of course, we will continue in making our argument clear 
that the member states should make sure that the court is capable of delivering justice in a manner which is acceptable. And that, of course, requires reflecting on resources provided to the court. But there are three ways in which we are looking at this issue now. The, the first is there needs to be and we need to think about ways to more adequately enforce the priority policy, to look at category one to three cases in a more targeted manner to try to expedite in particular those types of cases. The second approach we are looking at is the increased use of the committee system of three judges. We have already instituted what we call the broader Weckl program, the broader Weckl project, which allows us to filter more cases from chambers to committees if we consider that in general, the facts of the case and the legal issues involved uh, constitute well-established case law. It goes without saying the committee procedure is less cumbersome and allows us to deal with cases more expeditiously. The final element that uh, is very important and one which will be at the forefront of my presidency is to increasingly uh, be capable of adapting our working methods by the use of information technology. There are immense capabilities and possibilities in that area. The court has a fantastic IT department with ex extremely creative people where we, we, that I'm working with every day to try to find ways to, to create a, a, an environment where we can move forward more uh, faster by using the, the capabilities that information technology provides to us. Thank you very much. Um, Giospano, you've been sort of, you coined the term the ace of subsidiarity and it's been, you've been very much associated with that. And we have a, a, a set of questions related to subsidiarity. And one of them is that what are the pros and cons of process-based approach in the interplay of the court and national parliaments? And does the absence of a clear-cut set of criteria for what constitutes a good parliamentary process reflect a robust and coherent application of the principle of subsidiarity. These are so interesting questions. Um, the question there posed relates to uh, the application of the principle of subsidiarity when parts of the substantive necessity analysis by the court, usually under the qualitative provisions, Article 8 to 11, relates to parliamentary assessment itself of the human rights issues implicated. Usually the first case that comes to mind is animal defenders versus the United Kingdom, but there are other cases. Lambert versus France, SAS versus France, there are other cases where this element has come into play. The pros, the, the advantages of process-based review, the advantage of the court taking parliamentary assessment into account is first and foremost that it incentivizes the culture of human rights engagement by parliaments. Parliaments, in other words, by taking account of the human rights issues, by themselves engaging with the different conflicts of interest that are implicated in the most difficult of human rights cases between the individual interest and the public interest will themselves have, to some extent, taken ownership of the human rights issue in question. Now that, of course, as a general policy matter, is a good thing. The convention fundamental idea is to create a culture of human rights at national level. So that is, I think, the main advantage of process-based review uh, at the parliamentary level. The, the weakness and let's be frank, the weakness of that approach and the court's main challenge re remains, of course, uh, what, to what extent can the court make a qualitative assessment of parliamentary procedures and the substantive component of their assessment? Now here, up until now, the court has been extremely careful and uh, 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 we will see how the court will develop its jurisprudence in this area. But there are a whole host of 
uh, institutional and and structural issues that come into play in in that assessment, which which will we will remains to be seen how the court will deal with. Uh, in short, the use of process-based review for parliamentary decision making has certain advantages at the conceptual level, but at the practical level, the court must be very careful in not being caught up in a situation where the parliamentary process is in itself a facade. It does not, in, in, in essence, capture in good faith an engagement with human rights elements. So the distinction between the two is for the court to assess in a given case. Thank you. We will go on a little bit more about subsidiarity. We have another question. Uh, you have made the case for negative subsidiarity in the context of qualified rights in rule of law democracies. But what about the case for positive subsidiarity in these very contexts? There is an interesting premise to that question, which I'm not sure I agree with. Uh, let me first say the, cons the, the, the dichotomy of subsidiarity uh, as being on the one hand negative and on the other hand positive does not have any resonance in the case law. The court has never made that distinction in the case law, has never qualified the principle of subsidiarity in its negative orientation on the one hand or in its positive orientation on the other. But this has been uh, the way in which some academics and commentators have tried to theorize about the principle of subsidiarity. I remember uh, an extremely interesting article by Professor Eva Brems of Ghent University uh, in the Netherlands Quarterly of Human Rights published in 2019, where the argument for positive subsidiarity is made. My answer would, would be that the premise that my own writings extrajudicially on subsidiarity encapsulate the negative notion of, human, uh, of subsidiarity is in my view wrong. I do not think that my argument is based on the idea that subsidiarity and its robustness is good because it will create a less influential court. I think that is incorrect. Uh, the, 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 my view of subsidiarity, uh, which I think, and this of course is my own uh, reflection on the case law, my personal reflection, which I think resonates in recent case law of the court, is that the actual purpose of the subsidiary framework of the convention, which has been there since its infancy, there's nothing new about subsidiary. Subsidiarity is the underlying functional institutional pillar of the system, is meant to require national authorities to preserve and enhance human rights. That is the purpose of subsidiarity. And to the extent that the court has elaborated on that principle, has refined that principle, has clarified and even operationalized that principle, in its case law, it has been, in my view, the intention to promote what some commentators call positive subsidiarity. For example, the use of criteria for future cases in grand chamber case law, which is now a very traditional way for the court to proceed in its grand chamber composition, is one of the elements which encapsulates positive subsidiarity. Now, there are other orientations, which I know, of subsidiarity, which are meant to counterbalance the idea that the court may be overly deferential in some respects. Uh, but I would say the notion that there is a dichotomy from negative and, and positive subsidiarity, where the court has been more prone to, to apply an orientation which is in its negative component, I would respectfully disagree with that. Thank you. Moving from the perhaps more academic debate here to politics and the public, we have a question that starts out that in some countries the European Court has become quite controversial. And do you believe that an increased emphasis on procedural subsidiarity may help the court get a broader public acceptance or 
are people at the end of the day mainly interested in the substantial outcomes of the cases and not how they were treated in procedural terms? I th what I would again say about subsidiarity is uh, the court itself has no choice whether to build its jurisprudence on the principle of subsidiarity or the margin of appreciation. These are institutional components which are embedded in the convention system itself. What I would say, I do believe, and I've made this argument in, in the articles ref referenced, I made the argument that the sustained development of a true human rights oriented framework in Europe must be based on public acceptance. Human rights norms cannot be a pure top-down imposed system of values. It needs to be and flourish at the grassroots level, within the hearts and the minds of peoples. And it is the job of us, all of us, in the human rights field, whatever our roles, to try to incentivize that process. What subsidiarity does, it tells the national authorities, if you do your job and you do it in good faith, that may have consequences, which are that the court will look to the way in which you have examined the issue in a more favorable light. Will that enhance the legitimacy of the court overall? That is an answer that I cannot answer that question, but I would answer that at the practical level, at the structural level, it creates a system which overall is more balanced and again uh, enhances the core rationale of the convention system, which is that human rights are protected as close to you, as close to the person as possible that they are protected in everyday life by every executive official, by every policeman, by every judge, but not just protected in a faraway French city called Strasbourg. That is the whole idea of the institutional framework that we are now speaking about. Thank you, Giospano. We, we have a question that actually follows up on that, and it is, the challenges to the authority of the court have been numerous in the recent years. So what is it besides subsidiarity that the court can and shall do in order to regain, solidify and even expand its authority in the member states? I would say two things. The first is the court should never stop acting as a court. The court's legitimacy is at the end of the day based on it being perceived as I hope it is today, as an institution that functions, decides cases as a court in a disciplined manner, in accordance with the procedural rules in play, providing as clear and qualitatively good reasoning as possible. That's number one. Number two is the court is a forum where an evolution, an evolution occurs as regards our understanding of convention guarantees. The court is entrusted with the understanding of the way in which human rights guarantees and provisions evolve over time. This is the living instrument doctrine. But the living instrument doctrine is not an insulated doctrine. It is a doctrine that takes account of the way in which our understanding of convention guarantees is practiced all over the member states. It is for the court to be very clear that it interprets and applies the convention, not in a static manner, not in a retrogressive manner, but in a manner which takes account of our ever expanding understanding of the realities of human life and the way in which human rights guarantees within the convention as textually framed in the convention are to be applied 
to novel realities. For example, now the digital age, issues of family life and so forth. The court must be at the forefront of understanding and conceptualizing the way in which the convention should be interpreted in the future. Thank you very much. Let's turn to a question about law. We have a question about the Article 5-Article 18 cases. And the question is, is simply, have you taken any measures to uh, speedily conclude or prioritize these cases, Article 5 and 18 cases? Well, currently, the cases which you mentioned under Article 5 and 18 are cases which would be priority cases under the current policy. So either Category 1 or Category 3 of our priority policy would take account of cases which are, for example, detention-related cases. So no, uh, I do not see a need at this point to reformulate the priority policy because in any event, we take such cases very seriously. I, I assume the question is posed mainly in relation to the many, many cases we have uh, uh, from Turkey dealing with the detention of uh, judges, prosecutors, and civil servants. And there again, the, the issue is really one of bulk. It's one of the massive amount of numbers that we uh, have uh, in front of us. And that's why we have attempted to deal with the max mass influx of cases by identifying leading test cases which can encompass as many cases as possible when an outcome is, is found and a decision uh, published by the court. Thank you. Well, speaking of Turkey, we have received an, quite a lot of questions related to the 15th of July failed coup in Turkey and particularly its legal aftermath. I know that you cannot possibly address all of these, notably some of those that concern pending cases. So I tried to compile a little bit with the help of my assistant. Some general questions relate to this. First, and perhaps the most central question that comes up again and again, can you explain the court's decision to send back to Turkey tens of thousands of cases related to the state of emergency, and in particular, the insistence on treating the constitutional court as an effective remedy? I mean, uh, these are general questions and they deserve uh, an answer. Um, it is, of course, not for me to give an interpretation of our judgments or explain them in more detail. The judgments and the decisions live for themselves. But let me try to frame my answer in as general terms as, as possible in several components. The first logical answer to the questions in relation to the way in which the court has dealt with the Turkish cases is to emphasize again the fact that the European Court of Human Rights is a court. It is not a monitoring body. It is not a non-governmental organization. It is not a policy organ. It is not a political institution. Its decisions may have political consequences, true, but it is a court. And as a court, the European Court of Human Rights has to follow the procedural rules set out in the convention. Procedural rules which are rather strict when it comes to the admissibility of applications. So that's point number one. It may be a self-evident point, but it is the point of departure when explaining the starting point for the court's decision-making in this area. The procedural rule in the second point here, the procedural rule in play is a fundamental institutional norm under the convention uh, set forth in Article 35, and that is the rule on the exhaustion of domestic remedies, the exhaustion of effective domestic remedies. Now, this rule has been the basis for the court's approach to the cases that you mentioned. The criticism and the debate is that the court has dismissed cases without applicants being able to resort to 
remedies at national level which have been or which they consider to be effective. Now, following the attempted coup in uh, July 2016, uh, the court received, and the numbers I have in front of me, the court received approximately 38,500 applications. A large majority concerned the dismissed civil servants, more than, th than 30,000 cases, uh, including 250 judges. A special system was set up in Turkey, this ad hoc commission, to deal with applications for, from, for civil servants. And there, the system allows for the civil servants then to bring an appeal before the administrative courts and ultimately before the constitutional court. The decision by uh, the Strasbourg court in the case of Kuxal is a decision which is based on the idea that these, th this mechanism, this framework of remedies domestically would be considered a priori accessible. And at that point, the court did not, was not in a position to call into question the effectiveness of that remedy. And I think here one has to realize that the nature of the complaints related to the dismissal of the civil servants were of course mainly complaints related to the lack of access to court at national level because of the way in which the dismissals occurred based on the decree laws. I understand and I fully appreciate the criticism levied, levied, leveled at the court in relation to uh, this group of cases. But just to explain, it is based on the court's examination of the framework presented to it on the way in which it was to function and the court made absolutely clear that that is a conditional assessment in other words and this there is a, a long line of case law in various areas where the court makes a conditional finding on dismissing based on non-exhaustion of domestic remedies but makes clear that the court may in the future, when experience with, with the system at national level manifests itself, come back to the question and make a determination on whether uh, the effectiveness of the remedy has been retained. And that, of course, is an element uh, uh, we will take into account if and when applications will be lodged with the court uh, in the future uh, for the same group. Just Bano, allow me just to follow up briefly on that because, you know, practically every single organization, international or non-governmental, the EU, reads a conclusion that there are, by all means, no effective remedies. So, so are there changes that position following what you just said? And some of the cases also highlighted by many of questions indicate flagrant violations the relate the case related to the what is it called the bylock app, app, the judges, judges academics, academics, journalists, journalists and, many and many others. So so so, so I, I hear that you know it's conditional. But but what about priority? Are these just going to be stacked on top of all the other fifty thousand cases waiting? So so what what where, what's the perspective for these cases? Well, the perspective for these cases is clear uh, to the extent, and I think we have to make a clear distinction between those cases where the court is seized of an application of a, of a, on a detained individual under Article 5, on the one hand, and cases at, in relation to dismissed civil servants. Those are two diametrically different types of cases in the sense of under the convention and the way the convention is implicated, they are different. As regards the detention cases, my answer is the one I gave before. The court is proceeding with those cases with the utmost expeditiousness that it can. It is trying to develop uh, solutions and outcomes that take account of as many of these cases as possible because it goes without saying that a court of 47 judges with just under 200 lawyers having to deal with 60,000 cases, 
five, six, seven thousand of which coming from a particular country will have a, a, a hard time to deal with all of these cases within a short space of time. Uh, so my answer is these cases now are considered to be dealt with by effective remedies at national level. I, there can be disagreement on whether that finding of the court is correct or not. I appreciate that. But that is the current case law of the court. But that case law is, of course, uh, one which is open to reassessment because effectiveness of remedies is an ongoing issue which can be re re reassessed if evidence is adduced before the court, which would allow it to draw that conclusion. But as things stand, and I do not want to go any further because, I, 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 of course, I can't. As things stand, the court considers that the constitutional court of Turkey is an, is an effective remedy for Article 5 purposes, for example. And this is jurisprudence that goes back way before the coup d'etat of 2016. And as regards uh, the civil servants, uh, we currently are proceeding on the basis that the remedies at national level are effective. That's the current case law, but it is a conditional assessment. And when we are seized of applications, which call that into question as of today or in the next few months, the court will, if it considers appropriate, reassess that issue. But those, those are the lines and strands of case law that now are uh, in force within the court. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I appreciate your willingness to answer these questions. Another area where we have received quite a few questions is, of course, about the current pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, one of the questions asked uh, if, the, if you see any specific, specific threats to the legitimacy of the court posed by the COVID-19 crisis and, of course, the, how the court's reaction to the state measures directed to it. I assume this is in terms of state of emergency and so on. I have to say that it, it, one of the challenging elements of uh, starting my mandate as president on 18 of May last was the times we are living in. Uh, the pandemic, the health crisis requires from all of us extra efforts. The court has been, uh, and I must say, I'm extremely proud of my colleagues, the judges and the members of the registry for the incredible work that they have done since middle of March. We have dealt with the crisis in an exemplary fashion, I would say, considering the circumstances. Uh, my predecessor, uh, President Sicilianos, did extraordinary work during those two months, uh, his last two months in office. Uh, we uh, continued working uh, uh, by teleworking. Uh, chamber, chamber cases were dealt with mainly by written procedure. In other words, we kept productivity up. And it is our intention, absolutely, to, to not allow, if we can, any further consequences of the pandemic to have an impact on our work. I've said to my colleagues, both the judges and the members of the registry staff, that we may not be a, a part of the healthcare environment. We are perhaps, or certainly not, on the front lines of saving lives, but the court is on the front lines in another dimension of the pandemic because the pandemic puts pressure on the edifice of our democracies. It puts pressure on the principle of the rule of law. It puts pressure on the protection of human rights. And there the court must and is on the front lines of safeguarding the fundamental guarantees under the convention. It is very difficult at this moment. I think no one can predict where we will actually be in one year's time. If I were to give this uh, talk in one year's time, probably I would have to reevaluate most of what I would say now. So it's very difficult to predict to what extent the pandemic itself will create risks for the legitimacy of the court. My answer would be, the court has always in its 60 years history been seized or been under risk related to the challenges before it. That is the nature of the work of the court. 
It is a court which deals with very difficult issues for uh, which can have an impact on national political life. It can have an impact on social and economic issues of great importance. Re imagine, remember, for example, the issue of terrorism has had a lot of impact on the work of the court, so on and so forth. So I, I do not think that the pandemic will, as a matter of law, create risks which are different in nature and scope than the risks that the court is faced with in any event. Uh, the last point that I would mention here is When it comes to the current situation, one of the elements that I think we all need to look at is the way in which the pandemic, and now I'm speaking as, as from the perspective of the convention system, the way in which, or predict the way in which, one are applications related to the right to life. Uh, that can possibly be uh, a challenge put before the court. Uh, applications under Article 8, the right to private, private life and home, uh, surveillance measures and, and things of that sort. Um, applications under Article 11, freedom of assembly, uh, they potentially can be issues raised. Uh, applications under Article 2 of Protocol 4 related to their liberty, freedom of movement. All of these can possibly be, and I would predict, and I think that's justifiable, would predict that they will at some point arrive before the Strasbourg Court. They first have to be dealt with at national level. Uh, they have, they are already being brought before national courts, as we know, for those of us that follow uh, developments at national level in the member states. It is for the national judge to deal with convention-related challenges to pandemic measures by governments in a manner which conforms to convention principles as uh, derived from the case law of the court. When such cases come to the court, there will potentially be a need for the court to clarify the principles that apply in this novel field, a, a field which is unprecedented in modern human life, at least since 1918. Thank you, because some of the questions we have received in this regard actually concern related but yet different pandemic-related rights issues. One of them is, of course, inmates. And here we are dealing with issues that require speediness if they were to be addressed in any substantial manner. So there is in some jurisdictions, some member states of the convention system, you know, inmates are, are not receiving the treatment, they are kept locked up, they're very many in the same cells and so on. Another, another question we got related is, you know, the small social economic consequence of this. For instance, can it uh, justify the reduction of the payment of judges post-COVID when the coffers are, are empty at the state level? All this sort of could be wrapped up. To, are, there, are there any plans right now to, to take the current crisis into account in terms of amending priority policy to get those cases 
quicker before judges. I, I think you. I think it is important to realize that the convention system and the the, the jurisdiction of the Strasbourg court always has a certain time lag. When a convention issue is generated at national level, it has to percolate and permeate at the national level before it eventually comes to the Strasbourg court. That often can take a considerable amount of time. Uh, as things stand, the, the extent to which, for example, under Rule 39, our provisional measures uh, norm in our rules of court, we have not seen the need or have seen that our current case law in our current priority policy necessitates reformulation. But again, let me be clear, we are in, the, the pandemic is in this sense in its infancy. We may well have to look into those issues in the months to come. I do not exclude that. But to answer your question, at this point, we have not seen directly the need or to change our modus operandi because of pan pandemic related applications which have been lodged within the context of Rule 39. But I say this with some caution and some reservation because that is something we have to look at, of course, very clearly. Okay. Are you there, Michael? Yeah. I'm here. So we take another question from there, from Twitter. So one is asking from Brazil if a, a democratic virtue of uh, human rights law is its aspiration to universality. How do you assess the role of the European Court in shaping the principle of judicial judicial independence in relation to other uh, regional human rights courts? which might potentially face quite distinct situations while applying it. As I, as I mentioned at the outset, I am a great believer in the, in the notion of a community of judges. What I mean by that is the, 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 the act of adjudication, the act of judging the, in the human rights field has certain general elements which I think are shared by most judges dealing with this issue. I mean, I would hope, and, and this is of course something that I can reference uh, in our case law, I would hope that the cross-fertilization of knowledge gained by the jurisprudence of our court is disseminated to both other international courts, as we have seen, for example, in the European Court of Justice, which is uh, a, 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 a channel back and forth. We are, of course, regional courts in the same region of law. But the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, for example, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court is something we are very familiar, familiar with. We have very good cooperation with the Inter-American Court. We will, for example, soon uh, be engaged with a virtual conference on the way in which the pandemic has had an impact on our work, also with the African Court of Human Rights in the same manner. So I would, my answer would be, I would hope that our, the way in which we deal with issues of judicial independence will create a body of law, at least a body of principles, which are widely shared so as to be able to be enforceable and, and utilized across the world. Thank you. Then we have a question about the selection of judges. And the, uh, the question is, are you of the view that earlier participation of judges and human rights NGOs is a source of potential conflict of interest? Uh, I, I know where that question originates from. Uh, let me just answer generally. The court is composed of 47 judges from 47 different backgrounds, 47 different countries with variable professional experiences, which all come together to create a magical whole. It is the diversity of our group which makes it strong. For me, it goes without saying 
that we need within that diversity to have judges with experiences from all walks of professional life. The backgrounds of judges are set out in their curriculum vitae, which is delivered before the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe for all to see when those judges are elected. It is one of the strong features of the system that we have this diversity on the bench. Then we have another question about uh, separate opinions. So do you believe the question asks whether such a system of, of separate opinions is beneficial for judicial independence? And also it follows on, would it function at a lower level, at lower level courts as well? So the question is about separate opinion writing. The, the issue of separate opinions is, is an interesting one. Um, uh, any system of adjudication has its pros and cons. Uh, the, the system under the convention, which derives from Article 45 of the convention, is that any judge of the court has a convention-based right to file a separate opinion in a case where the courts deliver a judgment. There is an argument, a strong argument, for that type of system when it comes to human rights adjudication at the international level. It is the nature of human rights adjudication, which is a process of reflection, which often requires the exchange of ideas. We've seen in our court that views expressed coherently, structurally, and in a tempered manner by our colleagues in separate opinions has in the future led to a recalibration of the case law. And I think that is a good thing. My second point is it allows the judges also within deliberations to not necessarily always come to a conclusion which is uh, purely based on the lowest common denominator because it needs to attract as many votes as possible. Within the court, I will be very frank, we always try, especially in the Grand Chamber, to find a unity of purpose. It's very important that the court speaks with as much of a solitary voice as possible. We all strive for that and we work extremely hard to arrive at such a conclusion. But I think at the end of the day, and this has been my experience, the separate opinion system within our framework, within our tradition, is on balance beneficial for our type of adjudicatory process. Of course, when the separate opinion issue is discussed, it is often contrasted with the system under uh, in force in Luxembourg in the European Court of Justice. And I think there, that system for them works, potentially because it is to, to some extent not a classic human rights adjudicatory system. It has a much broader purpose, often de with, uh, dealing with extremely technical issues of the interpretation of secondary legislation and EU law and so forth, where separate opinion making may, may, may perhaps more detract that enhance the quality of the product. So that will be my general answer, but there are, of course, varying opinions about this. Thank you very much. You very much. We also have a question about uh, implementation, and it reads that 43% of leading judgments handed out by the court over the last 10 years are still pending implementation. So, so what can the, the court do to address this threat to its long-term survival and credibility? Um, I don't want with my silence to uh, be understood as to stipulate that that percentage you mentioned is correct. Uh, I will have to double check that. But it is true that the, the convention system does have some problems when it comes to the execution of judgments. That's clear. First, uh, a, a, a functional institutional point. The European Court of Human Rights is not, an, is not an executive organ. We do not execute our own judgments, for example, like the inter-American system. 
The executive body for the execution of judgments is the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. So, in fact, that question should be at the formal level directed at the Committee of Ministers. But that does not mean that the court can operate in a vacuum. The court must be, and the court is, attuned to the realities in the execution process. And when we formulate our judgments, when we formulate the reasoning and the operative provisions, of course we have in mind the way in which facilitating the execution of judgments is rendered easy or facilitated at national level through the Committee of Ministers. But there are no patent solutions here. Article 46 of the Convention is absolutely clear. States which are recipients of judgments of our court, the Strasbourg Court, are bound under international law to execute those judgments. That is an unequivocal, absolute, binding norm of international law. To the extent that judgments are not executed, we have to find a way in which the importance for the sustained existence of the system is made clear and answers are forthcoming for why judgments are not being executed. It's an, it's an incredibly important part of the system we have in place. But I would stop there. It is, it, as I mentioned, for the Committee of Ministers to fulfill its role and do it effectively and faithfully to secure uh, the, the, the effective implementation of the judgments of the one. Thank you very much. We also have a question about the, the debate about judicial activism in relation to the court's dynamic interpretation of some articles in the convention and perhaps particularly regarding Article 6 and environmental cases, the, the, the question reads. So, so, so this notion of a judicial activism or alleged judicial activism, could you say a few words about that? The, the notions of judicial activism and what is usually used at the other end of the spectrum, judicial restraint, are interesting concepts, especially for academic purposes, for purposes of commentary, but they are too binary. They are too black and white concepts if one wants to meaningfully use them to analyze the body of work of a court like the European Court of Human Rights. The judicial activism is usually used uh, within, within sort of negative or as a negative connotation of the work of courts. Judicial restraint is usually used by those that want courts to be more deferential as being a positive thing. In that sense, for me, both concepts have always begged the question. Activist in relation to what? One argument that has been made is that the court has been very activist when it comes to Article 8. Now, that of course means that, or the allegation is made, that the court has expanded Article 8, its scope of remit, its application, uh, far too wide. I can understand that argument. There are, there are strong counter arguments to that claim, but when we classify judicial pronouncements as or it all depends on what your policy view is of the substantive outcome. For some, a judgment of the court may be considered active, while others consider uh, uh, that, that, that it isn't. When it comes to the judges, there is also another problem with this binary connotation, and that is uh, whether a judge is conservative or not, liberal or not, which are other labels often used, is, is, is too simplistic. The spectrum of what is labeled judicial activism or restraint, you find variations, which again, uh, doesn't, doesn't allow the use of these words, in my view, in an overly simplistic sense. 
Thank you, Jospano. That's very helpful and I think very helpful also for young academics to get that clear. So going back to the compliance question you got early on, um, as part of the interlocking process and, the, and the, the whole question about the, the docket crisis that you saw around 2011, you know, a lot has been done, you know, the, the registrar said, but a lot has been done by picking low hanging fruit. So, so what is the strategy with regard to the court for dealing with the influx and possibly quite significant influx of cases in the near future? We already talked about the, the non-compliance with many grand champ adjustments, which needless to say is of course a source of more uh, cases. So, so what is the strategy going forward to deal for dealing with that? I, I revert back to the answer I gave uh, a moment ago. Uh, three things. The first is any strategy on the part of the court is a strategy which is limited by its resources. Uh, there is just so much that a group of judges and registry staff can deal with at any moment. That isn't an infinite amount. My second point is, however, there is a lot we can do. And there is Uh, an internal reform process where we are looking at our productivity. We're looking at ways in which, and I mentioned that before, Uh, applying the priority policy in a more strategic manner to deliver judgments within a particular field of categories one to three more expeditiously. And secondly, using the committee process of three judges in a more comprehensive manner to try to deliver m more judgments uh, uh, in, a, in, 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 in an expedite, expedited fashion within a committee well-being. Thank you. We're coming towards the end here. I have those three more questions for you. Two of them are I'm sure you can answer quite easily, but we'll start with the one that's a little bit harder and end on the easiest one. The, the question goes, what should the court do about bad faith criticism of and legitimate challenges, among others from executive brands, uh, branches of the state? As an example, the question goes, Theresa May's claim that Article 8 prevented expulsion cases because an applicant had a cat and, and so on. We have all heard these cases. So what is the role of the court in what you know by most means is a political game? The, 
of, of course, the role of the court cannot be one of day-to-day -day engagement with actors at national level that are criticizing the court's work. Uh, judges cannot be uh, part of heated domestic political debates about its work, its, its role, and so forth. Having said that, the, the role of a court in the 21st century is different than the role of courts and the duties of courts vis-a-vis -vis their societies in the 20th century. In the 21st century, in the digital age, where we are uh, more transparent with each other, where we are able to open up uh, our work and demonstrate how we do things, courts should be part of uh, uh, or engaged with their communities. For example, that is what I'm doing today. I am part of a process of explaining in general the way in which the European Court of Human Rights functions and giving access to interested practitioners and the public of addressing questions to the court and for me to give an answer to the best of my ability within the boundaries of what can be considered appropriate for a court. But a part of that is the need for courts, again, using information technology, to be visible, to be visible in the sense of not being mystifying entities. We are here to serve the people. We are here for the people. There is no independent existence for courts, which are beings and in and of themselves divorced from the communal life. So therefore, courts need to develop public relations strategies. Courts need to be a part of trying to understand how the message the court delivers vis-a-vis -vis their judgments is disseminated to the outside world. And I must say the European Court of Human Rights has been extremely active in that area. I would mention that we have at the practitioner level established a superior court network a few years ago, which now has close to 100 courts all over Europe, which are part of a dialogue within that network. We have a very active uh, website, which we try to disseminate our information, and we will now and are looking into ways in which we can increase dissemination of important informa information via social media. But there is, a, there is a balance here to be struck. But to answer your question, bad faith criticism by individual actors or politicians at national level is not a debate that courts should enter into. Then we have a question that follows a little bit on, uh, on uh, what you just said about uh, the future, new technology and so on. One of the, the hippest thing at law faculties today is of course legal tech, machine learning, AI and so on. What, what, what is the vision at the court of incorporating these tremendous advances, technology, AI, machine learning, particularly in the processing of cases? Um, our mission is one of, of uh, great excitement. I think we, when I mention information technology, that is exactly what I'm referring to. There are ways in which uh, a court like ours, which is a, a mass bulk case court with thousands and thousands of cases, it, it, there are uh, advantages and there are possibilities to use information technology, algorithms, algorithmic codes, to help us in the processing of cases and even in the future, uh, help us in the disposition of cases. But again, there are limits to that. I mean, the, the, the European Court of Human Rights is a court of human judges. That will not change, at least I hope not in my lifetime. But that does not mean that information technology should not be used to facilitate the judicial task. Not at all. 
and and it will be and it is now in the process within this to try to analyze how that can that can happen thank you and i've come to the last question which i've saved here for the very end because the question is what would president spano advise judges in their beginning of their judicial career in other words what is the career advice of someone who's made it to the very top of the european judicial system for young or aspiring judges that's a very good question the first one is uh, always be independent and here i'm not talking about independence in the structural sense retain your independence of mind make up your mind after you have assessed calmly diligently the case from all sides do not come to a case with a preconceived agenda do not make up your mind too quickly if you work in a multi-member panel make sure that you work in a collegiate manner in a manner which shows respect to your colleagues at any given moment and finally remember that judges must adhere to the framework their roles are given in the rules and norms ascribed to their function if one consistently is able to fulfill all of these criteria which can be difficult one will be successful as a judge. Thank you very much. I think we are now coming to the end and I would like to finish by once again thanking Judge Bano for accepting to participate in this event. This underlines to me that the court is not just up to date technologically, but also willing to share and to be transparent about its work. And in my view, both are fundamentals to the future of its work. So thank you again, Judge Spano, and thanks thank you to all much. of you for listening. And thanks to all for listening in and writing in questions. I know I couldn't raise all the questions, but I hope most of you got an answer. So with these words, I wish you all a nice weekend and good luck to all of you in these times. Thank you.